uh, you have great. Uh, yes. So you have 20 to 30 minutes to present and then a time for Q&A. Thank you. Okay, there, there's a lot, so I'm probably going to talk quite fast. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> All right, uh, so hello everyone, uh, lovely to be here today. The title of the project in my session is um, How Do We Cooperate, which is both meant as an interrogative, so what are we currently doing, but it also speaks to kind of reimaginings of cooperation. So I'm going to whiz through a very brief history of cooperatives in South Africa. Um, so cooperatives have been around uh, informally for a very, very long time uh, in South Africa and, and in fact across the African continent. This is the general way that indigenous societies have organized themselves. Um, but really in the late 1900s, we saw the emergence of more formalized cooperatives, which were mainly agricultural and involved the Boers uh, who, who came to South Africa a couple of centuries before that. So um, that unfolded, uh, you know, very much in sync with apartheid and all that came with that. But really cooperatives emerged as a, a policy agenda only in 94, and this was post South Africa's liberation. This included regulatory reform, um, including the Cooperatives Act of 2005, which was a long time coming. And really the infusion of uh, cooperative policies, both vertically and, and horizontally across scales of government. Um, South Africa is fairly progressive in the sense that cooperatives are linked to many other policy objectives. So addressing unemployment, poverty, housing, hunger, health, land reform, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, this uh, progressiveness only really exists at the policy level. I do also want to draw the attention of this group to a really important piece of work, uh, which is a book that came out in 2019. Um, that's been in the works for a while, edited by Prof uh, Vishwa Satgar of its university. And it really traces the history of cooperatives in South Africa and looks at various schools of thought on how to advance uh, solidarity economy pathways from below. So where does that take us to now? These are some of the challenges facing us in South Africa. Our failure rate of cooperatives is very high, even compared to global standards. It's up to 88% by some accounts. We are plagued by, by rife corruption uh, across the country. Um, the approach has very much been uh, top down to date. Financing is often misaligned or really inadequate for cooperative needs. There's very poor education and training, <clears throat> a lack of regulation and data. There are limited ways of pathwaying people into cooperative development, either as individuals or as organizations. And therefore, as a result of all of this, cooperatives have a really poor reputation in South Africa. However, um, there are lots of initiatives happening that are not necessarily called cooperatives, but that work in many of the same ways and are based on the principles um, as set out by the ICA. So we've got a wonderful center called COPAC that's been working on co-op and other policy alternatives since the early 90s. We've got a food sovereignty campaign that works in a highly cooperative manner. We've got something called the Makers Valley Partnership, which is a community-based initiative looking at the well-being economy, again, working in a highly cooperative manner. Of course, we've got cooperative associations. Uh, there are many solidarity groups, again, using cooperative principles and activities that have emerged out of COVID-19. At an official level, we've got a process that is the Social and Solidarity Economy Green Paper that's led by our Department of uh, Trade and Industry and also the International Labor Organization. And then we have a variety of other social movements. We've got something called the CANS, Community Action Networks. Um, they've been written about quite widely over the last year, which has involved uh, neighborhoods cooperating between them to address um, some of the ills that have come out of COVID. And of course, of course, we've got kinds of cooperatives uh, such as communes, uh, stockfills, 
which is a South African term for a, uh, a group that bands together in a, a financing manner. They pull their funds, consortiums, and so forth. So many of these are not officially, officially recognized. They don't fit into the narrow terminology that we currently have. Um, but very important to recognize as a key finding of the green paper that I mentioned, it's very difficult to box initiatives in South Africa in because we are a highly diverse country. Um, so we need to find ways of meeting people where they are and recognizing what they are currently doing. So then this project, what is its relevance? These are the touch points of the project. Um, we're looking at identifying outdated or incomplete data and hopefully contributing to those databases. We're hoping to help overcome overly narrow definitions, which as the previous slide uh, shows are, are very excluding. We're looking to define what cooperation means in a South African context in the present day. This is really a bottom up approach and response to understanding and making meaning of cooperation. And we're hoping to contribute to models and frameworks that are contemporary and relevant um, all while remaining inclusive at every stage. So these are the activities planned for the project as a whole. Um, it's a fairly new project and it's, it's been a little slow to take off because of uh, COVID related uh, uh, obstacles. So the first one is the how do we cooperate questionnaire and the findings of which or preliminary findings of which I'll present today. Um, we're then planning a, a round of unstructured interviews with some of the survey respondents. There'll be a write-up of the findings as soon as we feel we have enough data, and we'll use a discourse analysis methodology to analyze that. We'll uh, identify further research priorities and action them. Um, the plan is for this project to be positioned in the vehicle of a thesis. And then, of course, we're leaving room for any post-project work to be done, uh, to be defined at a later stage. So here are some of the findings and insights that we have so far. This is how the questionnaire was framed. This is the exact uh, text that appeared on the, the questionnaire that people filled out. Um, we've used as uh, the survey administration software, Ulkima. So everything's online. Um, it's accessed via a, a hotlink, and this has actually been available in the public domain to the public, which makes sense given that this is a bottom-up approach. And very important, we've provided a very loose definition of what cooperation is, trying not to be too prescriptive. This is really the actual process of working together to the same end. And in our definition of cooperatives in the South African context, we've included collectives and stock files as well. So we asked a question, this is what cooperation means to me. Um, we've got a word cloud here of, of really the main terms that emerged out of people's responses. So working was a big one, as was common. Uh, purpose, benefit, compromise was an interesting one. And then what we've done with these uh, slides is just really pulled out some of the verbatims that are standout. So this one working together from a base of shared skills and resources towards a common goal that was paraphrased in many ways and other responses. Um, I thought this was quite a nice one. Cooperation means coming together to collectively solve or design a solution to a common or shared problem that benefits all parties. Some examples of cooperation that we ask people to identify. Um, so in the word cloud, you can see working associations, communities, members, divorce, interestingly enough. Um, and some of, the, some of the salient verbatims here was uh, co-design of public spaces between communities and municipal teams, uh, wine farms that pull grape cultivars or maize farms that share storage and distribution. And then someone pointed out that running a community soup kitchen with neighbors was a form of cooperation for them. Then we ask people to define what is a, what is a short definition of a cooperative group. Um, so some of the words that came out of there, people, achieve, work, equally, 
creates members, resources, um, and some of the verbatims are several people who come together in an organized and structured manner to achieve a goal that has been clearly defined, or people coming together to form a group, association, or partnership to achieve a shared goal, or a group with an agreed rule system that values equally each member's contribution to policy direction, uh, recognizes shared ownership of the enterprise, and creates working structures that respect different strengths and capabilities. Then we ask some yes or no questions, and some of these are very interesting. Um, these have been based on the definitions that our government uses under the Cooperatives Act of 2005. So in my opinion, cooperatives must be legally registered. It's a bit of a 50-50 split, um, but more, more people felt that no, a cooperative does not need to be a legally registered entity to be valid. Does a cooperative need to be a formal business structure? Um, pretty overwhelmingly no, that was 60% um, of people said no. Cooperatives must have money. I was very surprised to see this um, because in a lot of social research in South Africa, um, finance and funding really dominates the conversation. But in this case, people have felt no, 76%. A cooperative must involve volunteers. Um, this was overwhelmingly yes, that was 60%, but still 40% felt no, leaving some room. Um, then we asked, Cooperatives must help members to meet their financial needs. And if people answered yes, we asked them please to describe what they meant. So we have a slight majority of yes here. Um, a stock fill is based on pooling investment funds for higher returns. The investment focus must be one that benefits all the members. Someone else said, as a business that cares for its members, its priority is to put measures in place to ensure financial literacy is addressed which was very interesting, but highly salient. We asked, um, do you feel that cooperatives uh, should help members to meet their social needs? Overwhelmingly, yes, this was more than two thirds. People said, in a broad sense, all needs are social, but cooperatives don't need their primary goal to be social well-being. That was one of the, the no's. Um, it should feel like people are included and that they belong and also by ensuring that they are well-defined, asking certain members to ensure that this is addressed and considered. We asked a question then around cultural needs. Um, should cooperatives help members to meet their cultural needs? This was a bit of a 50-50 split. Someone says, uh, as a social enterprise comprising people of various cultures, those needs should never be ignored as they guide the culture of the organization. And this brings harmonious culture fit. Um, if that is the goal of the cooperative, people's cultural needs can be met by giving people an opportunity to engage in cultural activities. And the co-op could help members meet this need by creating regenerative structures, practices, and principles which define and direct each individual's engagements within the cooperative parameters. Cooperatives should be run democratically. Um, we were hoping most people said yes, they did. It was 84%. Uh, every member of the group must have equal rights and responsibilities was one answer. This process is not a simple vote counting exercise, but more akin to a hotla meeting where special attention is paid, uh, given to understanding the logic behind an outlier or majority views. Um, a khotla is a type of traditional gathering in South Africa. Um, another one is everyone contributes, everyone should benefit and assume responsibility. Corruption is a huge problem when responsibility is taken away from the group. Um, quite a few people knew someone who was part of a cooperative group. Um, we then listed all the possible uh, legal cooperative uh, structures that exist in South Africa. So the list that you see here on the right is not all of them, but um, the ones that are not there were not ticked. Um, but some of the trends that we see here were uh, lots of agricultural cooperatives, um, lots of primary cooperatives, uh, social cooperatives, 
Um, some people said none of these. There were a couple of write-ins. Um, some people felt that the way that they were operating transcended definition. Um, and then this one was, excuse me, I can't see. Oh, this was what kind of services does the cooperative group offer? You can see food is huge there, number one. Um, lots of uh, food adjacent terms, farmers, uh, growing, agricultural, organic, agroecology, but also things like burial, support broadly, broadly uh, training services. Um, these were some of the interesting ones that I pulled out. Uh, so fundraising for early childhood education and development in rural areas is happening cooperatively, as is distribution of alien seeds. And then another answer was social services for children and our elderly, community policing, community cleanup initiatives, as well as burial services. Um, this was lists of the activities the cooperative group is involved in. There were quite significant overlaps with the previous question. Um, helping communities in a bigger spectrum holistically was an interesting answer, um, as well as team building theme days for the cooperative itself. Um, their recruitment drives for consumer co-op, co uh, project management coordination for the housing and manufacturing co-op, stakeholder relationship building for member co-ops under the umbrella. Um, so to give you a sense of some of the complexity that these organizations and groups are holding. This was what are some of the challenges facing the cooperative group. Um, I honestly expected funding to be a bigger word than it ended up being. Um, it was still number three, I think. But members really were the, the key challenge. Um, so people felt uh, it was a difficulty to have coll proper co collaboration by members, as some do more work than others. Um, members don't have time to engage in the aforementioned activities. But then some of the ones specific to, to financing is um, financing and diminished volunteer base because of immigration was an interesting one. Um, at the level of government support, there's, there's very little financial support for co-ops where fit for purpose or relevant training is provided. Um, but funded co-ops are not being monitored and evaluated. So it's unclear if the funding is utilized for its intended purposes. This uh, question was, what are some of the things you wish you could do through a cooperative? Someone said private prosecution services. Um, also learn new patterns of activity that respond to the reality of climate change. Uh, bringing the corporate or business culture to co-ops as most are being run unprofessionally and are not sustainable. Um, alien plant clearing, greening urban spaces with local water wise, indigenous plants, sustainable living initiatives, um, people are looking to farm locally on allotments to contribute to a civic spirit. And then people want more education on how co-ops should be run and then training for every member. Um, this question asked, are there ways of cooperating beyond cooperatives, right? So business is in huge letters there. A lot of people felt that um, some businesses were geared towards other forms of cooperation, um, but also in a social sense, uh, public people programs were some of the terms that came out. So someone said online forums and groups, another said uh, traditional business models, um, but mediation through trade unions and the labor force. Um, a third said, my view of a cooperative is not a formal organization, I believe that any small group with a common purpose for good is a cooperative. And that's the end of my presentation and I hope I was in time. The timing was so there's a, <laughs> Perfect, perfect. So there's, there's more to come. There's lots more work on this front. We're really at the beginning of the project, um, but very excited about um, some of the data that we're seeing so far. Uh, so thank you very much, Nicola. And I believe we have 20 minutes for discussion, but actually maybe we can take even more if uh, the people from the second paper are not here. Uh, but let's start with uh, 
uh, with 20 minutes. Does anyone in the room ask questions? Or Nicola, did you have questions that you wanted to have feedback on specifically? Anna? <clears throat> Uh, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the uh, sampling, actually. I, probably you mentioned it, but I think I missed it. Um, yes. About how the respond, resp what was the criteria for the respondents? Were they uh, supposed to be uh, par part of a cooperative or they that was not the requirement? Right. Um, so we actually didn't make it a, a necessary criteria for someone to be in a cooperative themselves because we wanted to think about this more broadly. So um, the, the survey, the link to the survey was actually published, um, you know, in, in, the, in the public domain. Um, we shared it across a variety of different networks um, and it was open to anyone to, um, to respond. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking that uh, might be probably different um, if people are speaking from a personal experience, from what they experienced in the cooperative, or maybe they never had an interaction with the cooperative and they kind of talk about more general uh, perceptions and assumptions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So um, one of the questions we asked was, you know, are you part of a cooperative? Um, so we will be able to disaggregate the data um, at a later point and compare and contrast. Okay. Uh, Rory, do you want to take the next question? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think, I'm not sure Nicola, if you were there on uh, the first day, but I, I mentioned um, yes. reading a PhD about a cooperation in Africa. Um, yes, and they remarked on the size of the informal economy across the whole of Africa. Yeah. It's, it's about ninety percent of people are working in what's called the informal economy. It's, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was very interesting. That fifty-two percent believe co-ops do not need to be legally registered to be um, uh, valid. I'm just yes, I read my own writing, and um, I'm just wondering what light you can shed because um, I mean South Africa is obviously more developed than other parts of Africa. But is this informal economy mm. very widespread? And do you think that 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 mm. uh, connection to the informal economy is, is influencing these survey results? Um, great question. Yes, I absolutely do. Um, it's difficult to estimate the size of the informal economy in South Africa, although some have tried to do so. Um, and it's, it's, it's large and it's growing, in fact, um, as formal jobs, you know, become fewer and fewer. A lot of people are operating in the informal economy. And I think that that has a lot to do with how people have answered, um, given that these are their lived realities and they're, they're operating informally. Um, there are movements to try to formalize the informal economy, but um, those haven't gone terribly well to date. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I guess I will go next. And my questions were kind of related yeah. to both uh, those of uh, Anna and Rory. So I found it very interesting to explore kind of informal form of organizing. Uh, and I really like the example of community soup kitchen. I think it's interesting. And uh, also I was kind of uh, very bewildered by the fact that half of the people think that cooperative did not need to be registered. Uh, and so I was wondering, because it seems like from the result, people still had some working knowledge of cooperative. So is it that there is a bigger culture about cooperative or is it that mostly you interviewed grassroots activists? So it's kind of related to the sampling <laughs> question. Um, yeah. And also uh, what are the reasons behind the overall culture uh, of uh, informal economy that makes it so that uh, so many people do, do not want uh, for cooperative to be registered is something that mm -hmm. uh, would be very interesting to know is it because they are, want to be more independent from the states because it's too much effort uh, like any right. feedback on that right right um okay so the the first part of your question was really around who's responded to the survey right um so i think that speaks to the networks that we shared it on and um, there's definitely a bias of activist types um who have responded to the survey 
um, a lot of people who are working in the food space, um, again, that you would have seen with the, some of the food centric answers that they gave. Um, but, you know, people generally who are who are in these activity networks that I'm part of or someone I know is part of. Um, there are plans, though, to um, be quite deliberate in getting, you know, more representative data from, from areas that maybe are not reached by the online survey. So we, we, we recognize that there are limitations, you know, with that medium. Um, so part of the interviewing will be, you know, actually traveling to, to some of the more uh, sort of peri-urban uh, areas to see if some of the responses differ there or, you know, maybe not. Um, then the second bit was around the informal economy. Um, it's a complicated concept uh, in South Africa, but some of the reasons um, that, that people are attributing to the, the size of it and the fact that it's growing is um, really we, we, we've been in an economic slump as a country for quite some time. So uh, formal kind of full-time jobs and things like that are highly limited. Our um, labor market absorption rate is incredibly low. Um, it's also a question of skills and education. We have many issues with our public education system, um, huge obstacles in terms of young people being able to access forms of tertiary education and training. And um, of course the formal sector, you know, is, is looking less and less kindly on these things. Um, I think it's also about proximity. So because of the um, kind of spatial um, organization of our apartheid years, you know, although formally we, we, are, we have not been in apartheid for 20 years, many of those spatial patterns have held. And so a lot of people are still concentrated in peri-urban areas such as townships. Um, and it's difficult and, and costly, you know, to, to move into other areas where, where more formal jobs exist. So what people tend to do is they tend to look for work that they can do within their communities. And that's often informal in nature, you know, things such as um, uh, frying balls of dough on the street and selling that or washing cars or, you know, other ways of kind of hustling to make ends meet. Thank you very much for your answer. I think, Roger, you were next in line. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, Nicola, for the presentation, which was very clear like the way you had the quotes around the uh, the points you were making um i i saw a presentation about uh, the burial cooperatives in south africa a few years ago and one of the um the issues there about not not be, being part of the formal economy was corruption um and that's uh, probably particularly sensitive around burial cooperatives which involves um, you know, sums of money for that have to be kept for quite a few years for paying for burial costs later on. Um, so that was one one point. The, the other points were that I, I did some work um, many years ago on South African cooperatives, and at that time, the, there was a um, there was a clear split between the sort of the originally white run agricultural and marketing cooperatives you know including wine cooperatives and so on and mm. the uh, the black cooperatives which were um at that time were, were run by there was a government policy for veterans uh, the war veterans to be encouraged to form form cooperatives mm. um and then there was a there were also ngos um in uh, promoting cooperatives and say craft skills and things like that. Um, right. Since since then, I've been made aware that there's there's been quite a lot of it, initiatives around universities. Um, and um, for example, now there's there's a guy called Keith Hart who's um, who's who made his reputation on the informal economy in in West Africa. He's in, he's involved with the University of Pretoria. Uh, there's Diane Holt and David Littlewood who've done work on social enterprise, uh, building um, building the capacity of researchers in some of the universities in, in Africa, including South Africa. 
So I wonder whether, you know, whether you could update us on the people promoting cooperatives, like NGOs, mm -hmm. the universities, uh, what's happened to the veterans, and and is, is there a, any um, linkage between those very successful agricultural cooperatives and the um, you know, much less successful um, indigenous ones? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, so the the I know of the Veterans Initiative, and look, there, there are many cooperative initiatives in South Africa, let us, let's put it that way, many spearheaded by government. Um, so because, you know, as I as I mentioned when I was setting out the kind of policy environment, our um cooperatives are integrated into to many policy areas in South African legislation. Um, often it'll be a case of, you know, oh, there's such and such government project and, you know, we're looking for cooperatives to apply. So um, what tends to happen with those is people quickly form a cooperative so they can be eligible to participate in that project and then it dissolves quite quickly. So they quite fly by night and I think that speaks to the high um, failure rate. So I do know of the, the, the Veterans Initiative. I don't know how that's going uh, currently. Um, but I could definitely find out. The University of Pretoria, um, so when I spoke about the Green Paper Initiative on the social and solidarity economy broadly in South Africa, um, one of the lead uh, researchers uh, or project managers, I guess, on that project is affiliated with uh, UP. Um, and so a lot of knowledge and, and kind of data is, is sitting with them. And they've been one of the partners in this Green Paper uh, process. But yes, it's not for a lack of uh, initiatives, but um, they're, they're not coordinated or, or kind of followed through on particularly well. I hope that answers uh, some of what you were asking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I guess it was Ian next and then Rory. Okay, thanks. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Thanks for the paper. I, I, I caught most of it. I must have missed parts of it. But I was reminded of uh, the annual lecture this year by Tara Moore Queen, which looked at the history of legislation in the UK to formally define cooperatives. And she established that the definition of the UK legislation was basically designed to eliminate political activity within the cooperative. So it was to basically delimit the cooperative to business activity and to prevent mm -hmm. a, a you know cross fertilization with politics now a friend of mine did some work on the formation of cooperatives locally in nottingham and they were established as informal organizations and they were political mm -hmm. projects so they the the project the cooperative was followed a thing called preference buying and preference buying mm. meant that you supported the Chartist movement, which meant that you were looking for a proper democratic settlement in the in the UK. And so it was it was uh, closely coupled, bound to the organisation. So it was serving two purposes to sustain a political activity to promote democracy. And it was also uh, generating funds and stuff and providing the activities that co-ops do. I'm just wondering whether in the early development of cooperative culture community in you know in Africa, whether there are similar processes are, are being followed. Mm. Um, so, so really speaking to how various uh, political agendas have shaped how we how we define and and kind of uh, hone in on on cooperative definitions. If I understood that correctly, and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, look, it's not, um, it's not a topic I'm, uh, I, I consider myself to be an expert in, but certainly in the, the policies that were formed in the early 90s, uh, post-liberation of South Africa, um, tended to be on the, the progressive side. Um, so the ANC, you know, that came in at the time, certainly they, they, you know, were a, um, they were espousing the, the Freedom Charter and, you know, sort of quite socialist uh, views. So 
many of the policies from then and, and even existing to now, you know, are, are um, on the side of, you know, how, how do we how do we make ourselves more democratic, all of the kind of thematic areas that came through at that time. Um, but in my research and in my reading, um, there hasn't been, what well, hasn't been clear to me, or perhaps there hasn't been a clear exploration of how cooperatives have been politicized in South Africa. Um, but I have no doubt that there is some of that and it, it's something worth exploring. Um, yeah, that's that's really what I can say on, on that topic. Thank you, Rory. Um, yeah, am I... My comment and, and question is, is about the, the positioning of the co-op world in relation to the social solidarity economy. So la last mm. year at this conference, we, we had a, um, a paper by Edgar Parnell arguing that the social solidarity economy is a watering down of the co-op concept. But based on what you've presented and based, I think, also from what Denise presented this morning, and also my own reading and understanding of, of the switch from the language of social enterprise to solidarity economy. The solidarity economy, and I mean, this is also reflected, I think, in Bruno's talk, where we learnt that mm. the International Cooperative Alliance necessarily has now got a strategy for embedding co-ops in the social solidarity economy because the United Nations has embraced the concept of the social mm. solidarity economy. So with all of this going on, it, seems, it, stri it strikes me that the social solidarity economy is the space, the, the natural space in which co-ops will be incubated. And because yes. the social solidarity economy includes the informal as well as the formal, it, it's mm. a much more natural incubator than uh, any, any other space that we've currently got in our economic system. So I'm just wondering how you, how you read that relationship and how you interpret mm. that relationship in, in the South African context. Yes. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, as of the last couple of years, uh, as this process has been gone, going on with the ILO, obviously being a, a UN um, organization, makes total sense that that narrative has um, moved into South Africa as well. So um, what's happened is a lot of people are using the terms kind of interchangeably. You know, we call it the SSE. Are you part of the SSE? It's the organization, the SSE. And it does include cooperatives. Um, the term social enterprise has become very popular in South Africa, especially in the last two years. Um, but again, people are grappling with, with what that means. Um, there's, there are fears, are, I see their comments in the chat, around watering down, there, there are fears that, um, you know, now everything is a social enterprise. What is almost, what is not a social enterprise? Um, you know, in South Africa, people claim that they start a business and it creates jobs and therefore it's a social enterprise. Um, so it's a bit of a, a, an interesting, but also maybe kind of problematic space. Um, I think what is positive though, is this SSE concept is starting to make terms a little bit more inclusive. Things are seen as more of a spectrum, but there's lots of work to be done, I think, around understanding what is and what is not. Um, probably regulating, um, because there are calls at the moment for um, adopting uh, something that I, I think it was in the UK, they did a, a buy a social mark that you can add to your business, you know, that then makes you eligible for, for various things. Um, but how really to, um, how to, how to audit that, how to regulate that, um, and to do so in such a way that doesn't um, exclude some of the smaller players who have fewer resources and, and less social capital and things like that to participate. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, Ian? Um, yeah, the uh, I was going to step back a bit from Rory's summary of Bruno's talk because I, I I think I prompted his commentary by citing the social economy, which has been pushed for the last forty years by the European CCOP uh, group, but has received very little attention in the UK. 
So in the UK, we've we've become a social enterprise centre <laughs> and totally missed out on this, what I think is an exciting development that has happened within the European worker co-op movement. And I think Bruno was saying that he was going to extend that. So he, he had been the general secretary of CCOP. He's now general secretary of the ICA. So it was progressing the, the, the development over the past 40 years that that have been done in CCOP and extending it out into a broader arena and this but this was also going to include not only worker co-ops but consumer co-ops and the rest of the co-op movement so I thought it was really exciting and not not necessarily social enterprises so it was more focused on the identity statement of the ICA on democracy and all the rest of it and I thought it kind of gave me a big lift uh to hear Bruno talk in those terms. So I think I think that hopefully there's going to be some more delineation and a, a bigger focus on uh well I I and hopefully even in the UK we might get to to get to consider something called the social economy. And interesting to to note the the different developments and understandings you know between different countries and contexts. So we might actually be running out of time for this first part of the conversation, but we can save some time uh, after the second presentation uh, if there is no third presentation. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there is no one from the co-authors of the second paper, which was uh, supposed to happen on this session. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So I think we can move uh, to the second presentation. Okay. Uh, so the third and the second presentation is from uh, Yamsid Abdul Aziz, and sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, and it's titled The Impact of Culture on, social, on Formal Social Enterprise Governance in Sri Lanka, The Case Study of Cooperative Network. Uh, and so the floor is yours for at least 40 minutes. Thank you, Lisa. So you can see the presentation slides. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased to present my paper because I'm one of the PhD candidates at Essex University. So I'm presenting this paper uh, as a first year student. I don't have uh, uh, started collecting the uh, data as yet, but I'm presenting as a proposal to get some support and ideas, some critical you know, evaluation of my paper that will help me to improve further in my research activities. Yeah, uh, the, the title, uh, The Impact of Culture on Formal Social Enterprise Governance in Sri Lanka, the case study of cooperative networks. Uh, so there's a bit of background to myself because I've been um, you know, uh, born and brought up in Sri Lankan context. I have seen so many, the political influence, you know, as I said, uh, the many of the, the government and the legislation, they are trying to ignore and avoid the political influence uh, in the cooperative sectors and the kind of activity in order to be fair and uh, transparent. So I'm bringing that particular evidence from Sri Lankan context here. So the, the main aim of the research is to investigate the impact of socio-cultural and legal factors on social enterprise governance in Sri Lanka. Uh, so I put two research questions here uh, based on my background of studies. Uh, it was developed through some systematic critical evaluation of existing literature. The first one, that would be how the social enterprise governance is embedded in Sri Lanka, the culturally formed logic and practice in Sri Lanka. The second question would be to what extent the Sri Lankan legal structure affect the inclusion of stakeholders in decision-making social enterprises. So, so I have covered some of the literatures in order to address, you know, uh, this has uh, put some of the two different questions based on my background of the studies. So I'm going to look at some origin and transitions 
uh, and conception of social enterprise gammon and that's very much related to my research questions one and the second one, the state of cooperative network and its legal environment in Sri Lanka, that's much related to research question too. So if you look at that, uh, the origins, the concept of social enterprise has recently been well uh, received by public sectors and it's been attracted many scholars uh, due to the long lasting radio debate and lack of consensus on the concept of social enterprises. So the spare also stressed the points that the origin of the language and its historical point of reference often have significant impact on the way the government systems are constructed and constituted. So therefore, it is essential to examine the context and expression of capitalism in which different school of thoughts have emerged its interactions, interconnection with different governance arrangements. So in order to bring up some of the, uh, the relevance to my questions, uh, research question number one, I have looked at some different traditions to connect with. Uh, if you look at the, the tradition, uh, US tradition, how it's been related to the, the governance, that's always uh, often refers to the notion of entrepreneurial activity of earned income which can be used to support in addressing social problems as an individualist approach. In this context, particular attention has been given to the individual and the financial success. So in the true US tradition, the individual and philanthropic characters echoes in the US style conception of the social enterprise and their governing system. In European traditions, if you look at that, the social enterprises and their governing systems are closely linked to the tradition of a social economy, the solidarity, democratic and participative governance that's situated in social cooperative traditions, whereby the cooperatives are the prime organizational forms of organization, which aims to provide collective social action. So in contrast, the governance arrangement often reflect the formal democratic management and participative style in European continent. So it is evident that the governance systems, it is shaped by their distinct origin, tradition, or personal purpose, different norms and legal forms and regulatory requirements based on the specific cultural context. So, when we look at these two different traditions, the mainstream US and the Euro, the social enterprises are adopting, you know, are adopted by the other nations, international organizations similar to Sri Lanka in the study, and other developing countries are caught in the middle since they don't have any appropriate legal framework specific to social enterprise at national level. So due to that fact, their work is often associated with the both side of the Atlantic. But typical barriers such as legal or regulatory framework, the financial resources and the market taxes those countries are facing is not common, but vary in their own context. So as claimed by the NOVA and parents, the social enterprises are shaped by the institutional and cultural context in which they established, hence the challenge they are facing, it's very specific to that context. And also been argued by Maya and Rather, society face, uh, the, 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 the different societies are facing uh, the particular issues, which is not identical, but varies in nature in terms of their political and regional context. Accordingly, the way the society deals with is also varies. So it is widely agreed that different countries have a unique way of handling their issues, integrate with the people, operate business, considering the local cultural needs and peculiarities. Therefore, addressing those challenges according to the cultural context, the wide implication on how social enterprises are prioritizing their resources when taking the strategic decision. So there are many scholars that have attempted to analyze the social enterprise governance with the different perspectives. So I have, uh, you know, quoted some of the, the scholars that have studied 
in order to explore the governing mechanism to tackle the missing drift. Um, and also they have employed some of the different theoretical model of agency theory, stewardship theory, and model of governance theory and the democratic or participative governance mechanisms. And also we have seen some cross-country analysis which has been undertaken to explore the impact of social, uh, societal level institutional logics on the government mechanism in the different contexts and some perspective on communitarian governance, you know, by Professor Reddy, uh, Rory. So nonetheless, all of the above studies, which I have seen that's heavily focused on the industrialized or well-developed nation where the legal structure and the government supports are widely available. So as emphasized by Galera and Bosca, our scholarship is not yet fully captured the wider spectrum of social enterprise governance and has been restricted within the developed nations. Therefore, the geographical bias still remain unanswered. What we know is little in the context of developing country perspective and the study of cultural impact on social enterprise governance is relatively small. So hence, is it vital to investigate the specific challenge and the different approach to social enterprise in the different geographical analysis, which may help to advance the field of social enterprise governance mechanism. So as informed by the literature analysis and to make a significant contribution uh, to this field of social enterprise governance in the context of developing country perspective, uh, the, my proposal, as trying to examine the, how the social enterprise governance is embedded in culturally formed logics and practice in Sri Lanka. So if you look at my second uh, questions about the, the corporate networks and legal environment in Sri Lanka, uh, as you know that is apparent that majority of the nations across the global have recognized the cooperative as a social enterprise they have established the appropriate legal and regulatory frameworks. In Europe, many of the social enterprises have adopted various legal forms and appropriate to their local context. So we have seen recent years, there are emerging economies also that have taken so much initiatives. Uh, I can uh, take an example of India, Vietnam, Thailand, and South Korea and Philippines. Uh, they have developed their own social enterprise, the legal uh, environment, the, the frameworks. So in countries where the specific law and recognition of social enterprises are absent, this may create a challenge for achieving its dual mission of social and financial goals and would find themselves subject to legal and regulatory frameworks, which is not appropriate. So this is very much appealing to Sri Lankan context, where there's no specific government constitutions or legal provision in place for social enterprises and a low level of government engagement and support in the sector is evident. So Sri Lankan cooperative system, as you know, it has been in operation almost 140 years since its inception start from 1906 and has been heavily criticized for an inadequate regulatory mechanism, poor internal governance and political interferences. The cooperative sector remains poorly understood and its specific governments and the governance challenge remain as largely unexplored. So in this expert, it's very important to discuss local context and challenges, whether there is a need for a new legal form for social enterprise or review and adapt uh, existing legal framework, which will constitute the explicit role of the board of members and the specific rules governing social enterprises in Sri Lanka. So the review of the above literature, the back the questions here, to what extent does the Sri Lankan legal structure affect the inclusion of stakeholders in decision-making in social enterprises? So uh, as part of my methodology, I have uh, put it uh, as an ontology, uh, the epistemology and uh, methodology, some data collection method. So my method would be the constructivist ontology. Uh, so assume that the different individuals perceive different realities accordingly. 
So I have chosen my constructive ontology in this paper. And uh, specifically in Sri Lankan context, there's a lack of understanding how the social enterprises are, the governed the logic behind their social enterprises. So uh, I believe that the interpretivist epistemology that will help me to, uh, you know, to find out an approach to uh, acquire the true knowledge about the governance and their culturally formed logics and practice through the social interaction between the people and the historical, cultural, and social context within the specific period of time. So I have decided to do some of the case studies that the current research identified the significant gaps in understanding the social enterprise governance and its social, cultural, legal impacts on property networks in Sri Lanka. So in order to uh, examine the research questions, a multiple diverse case study approach has been planned in order to generate theoretical insight by applying an interpretive sense-making method to understand the actors uh, and their subjective experience, uh, their meaning and how these meaning are constructed. So uh, this is all from my end. Uh, because as a PhD student, uh, I know that you are not going to throw hard questions to answer. Be nice and humble on me. Uh, but uh, the really, the reason I'm presenting this paper, because as uh, uh, starting my career as an early researcher in this, you know, so I'm very fascinated to see social enterprises and the cooperative sectors, which I have seen in, through my childhood. Uh, it's been very uh, politically influential, politicized. There are a lot of corruptions, so many things happening in Sri Lankan context. So in order to make it better, as a citizen of Sri Lanka, while I've been in the UK, I have seen a lot of good practices. So I wanted to carry out and uh, you know do some uh, the research that will uh, helpful for my community, you know, for the government, that they can learn something from the wider practice uh, across the globe, you know. So I would expect uh, some of the the real the your critical point where I can improve my paper in the future. Uh, please. Um, I would be grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Rory, do you want to start? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, trawl through the literature. I can see you've, you've got quite engaged with that. Um, my query, though, is about what you claim your methodology is. You, you've got a constructivist philosophy, an interpretive sense making epistemology, and yet you describe uh, it is deductive, whereas I would imagine it would necessarily be inductive if you're doing inductive. sense making. Oh, yeah, inductive, yes. I think maybe so, some type so, of. Yeah, so yeah. Revisit that. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, is there anything more you can say about the, the, field, the field work that you will be doing? The field work, because uh, I, I got the permission, because when I uh, apply in order to uh, do my data collection, uh, there was a COVID restrictions. I'm not able to go and visit anybody else. So yeah. uh, I, for the temporary arrangement, they have allowed me to collect the data through the interviews, I mean, over the phone. So maybe a Zoom calls, these are the things that's happening. Because Sri Lanka has been uh, put it as a red list, even I'm not able to fly and see other people. but. I have uh, uh, different networks and friends. Uh, they are working in uh, different sectors as a university uh, lecturers and some practitioners. So I'm I'm trying to get their help in order to uh, you know increase my network and yeah. do some uh, yeah the the, the okay well, good luck with that yeah yeah kind of uh, following up on the methodology question uh, first thank you for the presentation and it was nice i saw some connection with uh, the conversation that happened just before uh, your presentation so that was nice uh, i was wondering to the extent that you're interested in having an impact uh, whether more participatory action research would be interesting for you uh, or like do you just want to collect data and publish paper like have you thought about this, this question and is it something that would be of interest to you uh, because uh, when I was thinking about starting my PhD, I haven't thought about uh, there are some, you know, the different uh, discipline which is uh, there. So when I spoke to Professor Callum, he's uh, mainly at Essex, he's looking at the social enterprises and some kind of impact studies. 
uh, the, the, the SX is very well known for the impact research uh, anyway. So they highly encouraged me to look at the social enterprises. So I could really connect myself and my context in Sri Lanka, how social enterprises been developed, but not been recognized. There are a lot of social enterprises, uh, but the government doesn't have any particular the uh, law or any of the legal system to register any of the company under the social enterprises. Uh, they, they are very much freedom. Um, you know, they have a freedom to register the company as a sole trader or maybe a, the company under the company act or maybe as a volunteer, but there is no overarching body to look after it. So this is where I have realized that there is a much work has been, must be needed. So I wanted to start with this. Uh, when I look at uh, many of these scholars, they haven't come across about the social enterprises. Not much of a study has been carried out before. I think my paper would be a uh, open of Sri Lankan in Sri Lankan context, basically. Uh, many of the study has been done in India, uh, in, in other part of the world, but I don't know the Sri Lankan, uh, the government and this kind of uh, study hasn't been done before. It's, it's poorly, uh, it's been left out. So I, I, would, I would encourage, it's not encourage, I would expect any of the scholars, anyone in this forum, you know, the UK Society for Cooperative Studies, you have a lot of uh, uh, the well, like experts and practitioners and the, you know, uh, scholars. Uh, I need more support in terms of, you know, the collecting the data when I prepare my questionnaires, the way I'm going to handle the project in the future, another two or three years time. So uh, I really need it. Yeah, that, that's what I'm here to get more support and ideas and all of your critical uh, yeah, contributions. Thank you very much. Uh, Roger, I think you went next. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much, Jan. Uh, you obviously done a lot of reading around this this, this subject and uh, I think it's an interesting um, interesting PhD topic um, I've got a, a couple of uh, points first firstly we had a, um, a PhD student in fact a, a former uh, UK SCS uh, board member Rita Rhodes who wrote her PhD um, no she actually published a book on Empire and cooperation. Uh, which in, which was about the role of the um, the British uh, colonial office in in establishing cooperatives in in the empire, and there is a chapter on um, well she she calls it Ceylon. So I mean it only goes up to about 1950, but it it's interesting mm -hmm. because it does um, as you can imagine there's a sort of colonial interest in controlling. Uh, the the cooperatives and and not a, and sort sort of limiting their sort of self identity and self self governance to a certain extent um, so that that might kind of fit with your your argument about um, well in fact the registrars were were super strong and and issues of um, of, of limited cooperative spirit in them but it, it's a long it's a long time ago but it might pay pay some uh, some reading uh, it's uh, only one chapter in, in her book um, but the main point I wanted to make is that um, I did some work on on governance of social enterprise about 10 years ago and we we did um, we separated out social enterprise into four different types um, and I think in relation to, to your work it might be worth considering separate mm -hmm. separating out uh, the types of social enterprise um, and in fact, this this uh, typology has been echoed in in the work of the XM project, ICSEM, uh, run by um, Jacques Defourny and Martin Nissens in uh, Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the the, the two main type types I think would, which would bear um, separating out of are, are the cooperatives, the cooperative form, uh, which has probably got its own institutional framework around it and its own traditions and the nonprofit form, the associations, um, which similarly has, has got something different. Um, there's also kind of rather blurred uh, category, which is um, the, the, 
the business with a strong social objective, um, which is, you know, it, it can be a bit flaky, but it can also be interesting. But it certainly the first two uh, categories, I think, would bear separating out um, in, in, in your research and would have, you know, different traditions and institutional configurations, which would, um, which would lead to different governance considerations. In, in our publication, we, we also identified different uh, governance issues for those, those two forms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, uh, thank you so much for your input. Yeah, yeah, uh, well received. And uh, if you can send me some of the link, then I can uh, you know, go through that link and study some of the, the different uh, kind yeah. of methodologies. It, in that it was so. called Full Love and Money. I think it's still available. Okay. Right, okay. Should be findable as a PDF, shouldn't it, Roger? Mm -hmm. Exactly, but I, I'll I'll see what I can find it and put it in the chat. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Ian. Hi, uh, thanks thanks for your paper. Um, I've been involved in this trying to untangle what a social enterprise is for for a long time now. Um, I did try in a regeneration project locally to advocate cooperative values and principles because the regeneration project didn't know what it was for after mm -hmm. two or three years but i was told by the business development manager that there were two ways of approaching this one was freedom and democracy and the other way was communism and he then went around the room and took up took and uh, tore up all the values and principles statements so there's a values basis that you need to get to the bottom of uh, I'm involved in another social enterprise, which was formed out of a local health and social care group. And I think it's really important to know who's advised on the constitution of the social enterprise. So in the case of our local health and social care social enterprise, it was a, it was a management consultancy called KPMG. KPMG. And, uh, and then they're not very good on democracy. <laughs> They're quite good on enterprise, but they haven't a clue, as far as I can tell, about uh, modes of governance. They're very good at charging lots of money and framing the way the social enterprise is going to operate. So that, that, I think that's vital to know who is, who is the advisory body that is enabling the social enterprise. Because, it, I mean, 10 years on now, it's, it's starting to tell so that you know, the structure starts to become very much budget based where initially it was anyway. So it was practitioner led. So it was nurses that were defining this new social enterprise. Now it's budgets, money and cash flows. And uh, and that's not a great position to be in. But I, I, I think so. I, I should look very closely at the people that are putting the Constitution together. OK. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, and also because uh, uh, I think uh, two days before the first day, uh, Anne was talking about how do we define the social enterprise and the cooperative networks. Are, are we going to talk about the typologies that are going to be two different uh, organizations when we uh, typically categorize that? Uh, do you think my case study based on the cooperative network, when I look at the social enterprise governance, is that going to be linked together? Or am I focusing the case study, which is totally uh, from the social enterprises? I have, to, I have to comment. I think you need to take Roger's suggestion seriously. I mean, the social enterprise isn't one thing. It, there are multiple traditions that feed into the language and the governance. I mean, there's been work since I mean, even, even going back to around Roger's time, I think I wrote something in 2007 about three different yeah. governance logics that, that were informing social enterprise governance or communitarian forms of social enterprise governance. So it comes before the paper that you found where I did yeah. the case study work in Mondragon. Um, and that, that, was more, that was more about the philosophies, the underlying philosophies yeah. of three different governance logics. Um, and Tracy Cool. Tracy Cool has also done a similar job in the the non-profit part of uh, the social economy. Um, so there, there's some good work out there. 
Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening and uh, your constructive feedback. Yeah. Thank you very much. I also encourage to look at the conversation in the chat. It was quite uh, <laughs> intense discussion. Uh, the well, I guess the people for the third paper are still not here, so probably we're getting close to the end of this session. And let's